Now, um, please, uh, please stay online. Um, mm -hmm. Don't run off and get yourself a cup of tea yet. Um, so what I think we should do, I mean, we have uh, roughly an hour until lunch. We're going to squeeze um, the elevator pitches. I think most of the chapter authors on the water security book, or at least some of them, are not going to be here until the afternoon. Uh, but I think what I will do is ask Bruce before we break for lunch just to you know, perhaps tell us what that what that book is and give us a little and f give us a little highlight before lunch. Uh, do, we, do we get free copies at all? Um, <laughs> no, it's okay, you don't have to answer that. Um, so uh, why don't we gather the um, panelists? Alan, if I could invite you up here um, for, the, for the discussion that follows. We're going to have to juggle the mics a little bit. We've got to speak directly into them. Um, Any more well, we have uh, Karen still on line. Um, no, it's yeah. us for the moment. But we will be roving amongst you, at least um, um, Alan will, um, just to get uh, as much sort of audience participation as, as, as we can. Um, so, Alan, you grab a mic. Let me start by saying, you know, you've heard the last two authors there, Bruce and uh, uh, speakers, Bruce and Bruce and Karen. Any particular comments, reflections, questions on what you've just heard? So let's run these together. Let's have um, John uh, um, and let's have Lila. Let's start with, okay, let's start with three. So we go to uh, those three. Guy, can you spot them all? Let's start with John over here. Can I ask a comment on the presentation? Is that all right? Sure, just tell us who John you are. John Chilton from the International Association of Hydrogeologists. I want to just put in a little word on behalf of the medium and small towns in relation to what Bruce said and competing water uses because uh, in some of the areas that show on Alan's map as yellow, in the sort of middle range of water availability, there are also some pretty important fast-growing medium and small towns. And the Makutapura Basin, the reason why Alan's able to show us such a long time series for that is because it's a favourable location in his generally yellow areas, which is, provides the water supply for Dodoma. And we should, uh, we should keep in mind the balance between irrigation demand and some of these fast-growing towns where groundwater could be the solution for some of their p current problems. And just uh, yeah. a word yeah. on their behalf. No, good point. Um, and, and raised by a couple of the, a couple of the speakers. Um, so we had uh, two. I was going to take two more. There may be some others, but... Uh, yeah. Um, uh, let's go yeah. over to... Could, could I... S I've ah, got the microphone, <laughs> you right? I've got the microphone, so I'm going to speak next. I, I'm Edward Mallory. I'm an independent consultant. Um, I wonder if we could have something on the context of groundwater irrigation vis-à-vis -vis surface water. You know, is groundwater the majority, a tiny minority of irrigation? And are we talking, if we're talking surface water, are we also talking about small-scale farmer operated or are we talking about the big canal schemes. You know, wh how does it fit in the overall context of in sub-Saharan Africa? Good, thank you, Lila. Let's let's run. We're going to run four together now. Don't uh, don't worry. I'm remembering you. Thanks, thanks, Roger. Lila, I'm at the uh, Institute of Development Studies. Uh, Bruce, I loved your account. I wonder if you've written it up because it's a really fascinating. Not in terms of in terms of the politics of the policy process of what gets in or not. So I think. There's really a very interesting article in there. I'm <laughs> just in terms of how report writing takes place and what's included or not. And I'm currently going to be doing a similar, another report on water for food for the high level panel uh, of, on nutrition and food security. So it'd be really good to get insights on this room, from this room, in terms of what, is, what are the hidden stories that should get in there, whether they actually end up in there or not is another story. So I think that's something we can analyze later. Um, and finally, one last thing I wanted to talk about was there's, an, uh, there's a huge story to be told about the links between roads and groundwater. Mm. 
and I'm currently involved in an upgrow project led by Meta Meta in Netherlands around this, really trying to track um, some of the linkages, both in terms of you know uh, the, the hidden potential, but also some of the problems that can arise and impacts on livelihoods. So I think there's another story unfolding. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take one more. Are you going to hold hold good memories, you guys? Let's let's go one more. And I must also remember that we're getting some questions here from our online audience. Thanks for the reminder. Okay. Thank you so much. This goes to Bruce. Thank you. Uh, Just tell us who who you are. Violet Alinda from Uganda. Welcome. Working with the Global Water Initiative. Uh, well, Bruce, you did mention about the cost of irrigation, setting up the systems and technologies. And within me, I was asking, who picks the cost of the water? Mm. Yeah. OK, thank you. So we'll take this round of, of questions uh, for the speakers to come in on, on whichever questions they feel comfortable to answer for. Then we'll go to our, roam, our roaming reporter, Alan Nicholl, over here, and we'll get a bit more interchange amongst you. So Alan, do you want to pick up? Um, Perhaps uh, John's point. Um. Yeah, the, the first point uh, made about uh, small towns and uh, the competing nature for, for groundwater resources. I mean, one of the, the issues with developing groundwater for, for small towns is, this, is the low permeability of a lot of the populated part of Africa. So uh, the, the crystalline basement rocks, which underlie about 40% of of Africa are not particularly permeable, and this is this is a sort of key issue with a uh, with groundwater development. It's almost a self-regulation of this aquifer, of this groundwater resource. You, it's quite hard to pump out too much from that type of rock. You know, you could maybe get out half a liter a second, but to get out more than that, to get out five or ten liters a second, which would be useful for small towns or for larger or middle-sized irrigation systems, it's actually really, really difficult to do that. The aquifer just won't allow it. The water will not flow into the boreholes su sufficiently. So I think when we come to small towns, uh, if they are going to rely more on groundwater, it does involve investment in, in siting well fields, as, what, as happened in Dodoma. Uh, as, as you mentioned, John, there was a lot of investment in trying to find the, the right place to put a well field that would supply supply that tone. Now, before I bring the others on, I mean, Alan, um, maybe one for you as well, uh, Karen. Uh, we've got a question here from Seifu Kabede, who's a, a hydrogeologist at the University of uh, Addis Ababa. And he's talking about, you know, the sort of watershed development, watershed conservation programs that are so much a feature of, of, of what is happening in, in India, for example, but also a major part of sort of social safety net programs throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Um, certainly the ones in Ethiopia, Seifu is saying, do not explicitly um, uh, look at um, uh, groundwater recharge. So although there's a lot of um, land and soil moisture conservation activities and maybe some assumptions being made about groundwater recharge, you know, what, what could we do not just to deal with the the, the, what we have in terms of storage, but what, what, how it could be augmented. What's the latest science on that? Karen. Karen. Um, okay, thank you. Um, yes, I agree that uh, uh, these watershed management uh, programs in India have been quite uh, successful and and seems to be taken up by the by the local uh, sort of stakeholders, and so it might be a good. Um, sort of uh, example uh, to also uh, develop in Africa. I think uh, it's probably not that far in Africa, but uh, with time I think it will be much more important uh, to look at, at, at uh, the resources in a larger uh, sort of geographical context. And then of course it becomes important once uh, sort of dependence on groundwater increases is to understand the resource uh, replenishment and, and uh, how it um, matches with the, the demand, and that's also what we're looking at in, in one of the upgrow uh, projects uh, going on at present. Um, in top Saharan Africa, there's not much uh, done in terms of enhanced recharge. Uh, there's a, some work going on in Kenya in terms of the 
what they call sand dams, where they uh, they make dams across small streams that are maybe uh, ephemeral. And then uh, the idea is actually to catch the sediments, the sand behind the dams, and then this, this becomes like an artificial aquifer that then collects the water that uh, uh, that is uh, running during uh, the, the storm periods and so on. And with that, with time, you generate a larger and larger aquifer. So that has been uh, one of the techniques that has been used and, and quite effectively for smaller communities. It's not something that you can develop maybe for larger cities. So um, other than that, I, I don't think there's, well, in South Africa where I am, there's uh, uh, experience with uh, artificial recharge, but it's it's much more technically um, advanced than it would probably be uh, possible in, in many of the other African countries at present. But of course, uh, there are some lessons to be learned that I think we should should look at and see what could be transferred uh, to to uh, the sub-Saharan context in general. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Karen. Now, Alan, you may have something on there you you can introduce later, but I want to go quickly to over to over to Bruce, perhaps. Um, um, interesting tales to tell, politics, uh, or maybe you want to pick up a couple of the other questions as well on sort of scale, typologies, costs. Well, um, thank you. Very briefly, Lila, thank you. And I have, do mean to write it up, actually. I was going to let a little bit more time just in case somebody's going to sue me for, or I think it was great that somebody re remembered that UEA was known for its leaky emails, so perhaps I need, need to let another year or two go, go by. Um, I think the connection between roads and groundwater are absolutely valid. I mean, I think that's, in a sense, probably was part of what I meant, you know, through a sort of comprehensive approach to irrigation development. A solution to irrigation is not necessarily putting in a pump for groundwater, it's putting in a road, because then farmers will make the decision about the investment in the small-scale diesel pump that's required. And I think that's, you know, more research on that would be, would be very urgent. Um, I think this question from Edward Mallory about the mix of groundwater and surface water, I, I, I mean, I'm, there are many people who work in Africa in the room, um, so Charles and John, you're here. I, I wouldn't like to generalize. I think, in fact, if I'm going to generalize, it would be that it's very variable over time and space. Um, it's very different to the situation in Asia, which where you can go to pl uh, floodplains, which are you know, have seen a switch from canal irrigation to borehole uh, to boreholes, and that the the way that they use conjunctively, um, or at different different seasons and also different parts of the irrigation system. So tail end farmers using more boreholes because they're compensating for the variability and uncertainty of supply. I think in sub-Saharan Africa, if I was to generalize, it would be to say that I can't generalize. <laughs> I'm afraid. But you know there may be others in the room who are beginning to see and spot trends to answer your question. Um, I think the lady from Uganda, um, sorry, I missed your name. Violet. Violet. I think you raised a very important question. Um, the cost of water, uh, you know, it hasn't been really raised here. I think the cost of electricity is something that um, is going to be very significant. Uh, sorry, the cost of energy, we should say in terms of groundwater. And I think the, the thing that was on implied on l the uh, penultimate, sorry, the slide before this of Karen's presentation, is the, the, the social costs of managing water. Um, you know, maintain, maintaining <coughs> systems. Um, it wasn't on an, an earlier slide of the value chain costs of groundwater development, but it was on her conclusion slide. So I think there are proxy costs, not necessarily just directly of a cubic meter of water, um, which we need to be very you know, cognizant of when we come to develop groundwater. I think I'll stop there. OK, I mean, um, I mean Alan, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe we should find out what, 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 your, what, Violet, uh, what Violet thinks. Yeah. Charges in, can I, to the meeting? You Trying might. to stimulate a little bit. Um, ground to growth, whose growth are we talking about? Firstly, uh, we talk about smallholder farmers, fine. Uh, are we talking about associations, individuals? Or Bruce mentioned, how many of these treadle pumps can you fit on a large scheme? So what kind of groups are we talking about here? Secondly, whose groundwater? So 
Where do the rights regimes, the actual physical property rights regimes fit into this picture? Highly complex environments. It may be an easy uh, resource to access in some areas, but much less so in others, particularly when it becomes um, highly abstracted and under, under great demand. So I'm going to rove with the mic. I may even pick on people simply because I think they have something to say, but they haven't said it yet. <laughs> so, going over to this direction. Madam, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Liz Orton from University of Newcastle-Pontine. What I'm interested in, particularly about your question there, is where the power lies and who's actually making all these different decisions and who they're concerned with when they're making those decisions. And I think that's relevant to, to what you're saying and in a way to what Violet's saying as well. Um, those who are affected are not necessarily those who have the power, um, even when systems of governance are set up, which would appear to, to work. And I think that that's something that we should be exploring a little more carefully, perhaps. Very bad question. Roger, you may have to regulate me a little bit too, but uh, let's see how it goes. It's difficult. Yes, Don, I see you over there. Uh, Don Brown from IWELL. In a way, following on from this comment here, I'm a bit concerned about um, the overall resource management. It's been mentioned about watershed management uh, and then who makes those decisions. I've not heard integrated water resources management being mentioned yet today, which, as you know, has been promoted for quite some time around the world and in Africa. And, and under that, you have the stakeholders who then make the decisions as who moves forwards. Um, and relating it specifically to the groundwater use, uh, I presume that was the Usangu wetlands that was shown earlier by Dr. Karen. Um, and also in Nigeria, you've got the Nguru wetlands. And you have, and Alan might have an answer on this, I think significant, strong irrigation potential from groundwater on the edge of these wetlands. But of course, you've then got the marginality of the ecosystems um, and the use of that. And on top of that, it's been proven by a lot of people with the economics of those wetlands that they're making more value out of the wetlands themselves than they would do if they moved into irrigation, which comes back to Bruce's point, really it's the value of what you're achieving rather than the amount that you're achieving. Very interesting points. Uh, Alan, was any thought um, given to the, the value of that big blue blodge on the map in, in Africa? Was there a sense of what could this resource provide economically? Well, the issue of the big blue lumps under the Sahara is that they're far from anywhere and they're very expensive to exploit. So uh, it, that we've done some other work uh, actually in the, in the Middle East which, uh, between pa uh, the West Bank and Israel where we looked at the costs of development. We developed these maps called ISO costs, which is just about the costs of developing groundwater. And uh, and, and it's very interesting to look at, uh, certainly in, in that area, where the most efficient ways of developing groundwater were. They're actually right on the green line between the West Bank and uh, Israel. But that's another, another story. Uh, I, th I think uh, the recharge is important here. The recharge to the groundwater resources. There's, there's a lot of, been a lot of discussion about sustainability. Uh, well, actually, Groundwater can be overexploited and is in many parts of the world. That storage can be overexploited and groundwater levels can fall, and that can have good economic benefits for some. It can have ecosystem costs, as you were saying, for your uh, for 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 these ecosystems you're you're mentioning. But it can be overexploited, and that was the point I was trying to make with these groundwater storage maps. Is that the you know Karen's maps of uh, of sustainable abstraction were all about recharge, so sustainable groundwater irrigation will happen where there's already a lot of rainfall and a lot of recharge, but away from these areas where we have significant groundwater storage, it will not be sustainable, but yet there might be, it might be expensive to develop, but there might be great economic value in that. So that's, that's really as a hydrogeologist that I'd like to, to add into the, this mix. If we're not going to just do things sustainably, uh, then what are the costs, what are the benefits, and, and who may benefit from that. Brilliant. I want to bring in someone who's spent probably a decade or more actually abstracting or using some of that water. Brendan. Hi, thank you very much. Um, just under a decade in Sudan, um, 
UNEP's program coordinator for the last seven years, very interested by these comments about uh, conflict of interest because, and also these big hyped stories about vast amounts of groundwater, because we saw some massive stories around that in Darfur, the ancient mega lake being the most famous one, 500 kilometers north of El Fasha. So nobody lives up there. And um, yet it was a huge story and the means of solving the Darfur crisis. And what we found is that there was very little interest in regulating groundwater abstraction. Um, uh, because of the organizations, international organizations and government organizations, who it was their lifeline financially and, you know, bringing things into sustainable kind of abstraction. And um, places like Niala, the largest city in Darfur, grew from 400,000 people to 1.4 million or so, we don't really know, during the course of the first few years of the conflict. And one of the aquifers ran dry there. And at the same time, they people carry on, on pumping. So just to, to reiterate this question uh, around growing cities and, and emergencies, can I just, having said that, I've got a question which relates to livestock, particularly for Karen, because one of the very interesting things here is um, about pastoralism and uh, the way they use green water. So the rationale for migratory pastoralism could be summed up as saying, in areas which are water variable, if you move your cattle to the areas where rainfall has recently fallen and are re-green, it's an efficient system of capturing green water. And I'd be interested to know if there have been studies which compare the efficiency of that capture of green water with other livestock production systems, maybe which are dependent on blue water, can maybe groundwater. And then also just to bring into that the fact that in Sudan, its widely received figure but not proven is that 90% of the livestock production is outside of the formal uh, economy. So what is the control, what is the governance system if it's being customarily governed and what is the efficiency and what are the financial flows behind that? So interested to um, hear more <laughs> about that. Thank you, Brendan. Um, Tony, you were frowning there, which always means you have to be brought into the <laughs> discussion. So I shall hand the microphone over to you. <coughs> I, I wasn't frowning. Uh, uh, <coughs> thank you very much. We, can I relate to the issue of power and draw attention of the room to the fact that the, the, the system that uh, manages water is the political economy of agriculture. So 90% <coughs> of the water we need is in our food. That means 90% of the water <coughs> is managed um <coughs> in that food supply chain. 90% of that 90% <coughs> is managed by, by farmers. And farmers, by definition, in Africa, some schemes that they will, they will be some powerful farmers, but <coughs> in fact, farmers are without power. They're either subsistence farmers, not even in the market, or uh, when in the market, having a very rough time because they don't have any <coughs> power to, um, uh, to uh, fight for their entitlements. And yet, of course, we depend on them not only to become more productive, but we also depend on them becoming <coughs> um, uh, good stewards. In the past, farmers just did what they did without being good stewards necessarily of water. Now, from the wise uh, citizens of London, we insist that farmers should be good stewards as well. In fact, they've only been asked to do that for the past 30 years or so, uh, but we are now uh, expecting African farmers to be to uh, to do the right thing. I, I loved um, the message which in another place you about four or five years ago coined the phrase hesitate to irrigate, which I think was a, uh, could have been a good title for your talk this morning, uh, because we not only need them to hesitate to uh, overuse water, which they will tend to do, as mm. you said, um, uh, as well as to uh, help them to become as quickly as possible good stewards, which isn't the natural inclination. Mm. So can I just therefore draw the room's attention to the fact that we do need to expect the solutions to water security and food security to be achieved by farmers. Well, Does it bounce that to you, Bruce? Yes, that's, that's fine. I mean, uh, I, I agree with Tony on that. And... Um, you know, vast amount of water is consumed by irrigation, uh, sorry, by agriculture, and combination of 
groundwater, surface water, blue water, green water. Um, so I, I, I don't differ on that. Although uh, to the idea that farmers manage water, I think we could also add, and those very closely associated with farmers, such as irrigation engineers. Um, yeah, yeah, the farmers aren't. Yeah, so I mean... I have 10 million farmers. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> but, but it, certainly through my work on irrigation systems, the, the way that it water permeates through those <laughs> systems is connected to the, the idea of services and the idea that there may be gatekeepers. I mean, they're very, gatekeepers are not necessarily farmers, although they can be. The gatekeepers are at the very lowest part of the sort of pyramid of, um, you know, those stakeholders who manage water. Uh, but about four to six cubic kilometers of water per day are managed by people who never get talked about, which are gatekeepers. Um, and so it's not just farmers, it's all kinds of marginalized, hidden people that manage very large volumes of water. Yeah. Very good, Bruce. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, Roger, with your permission? No, don't, oh. no, don't forget about this side as well. No, I won't. Good. But via the onliners as well, is Yes, anything? we've got one more, but you go yeah. ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Ben roberts Brill. I'm a master's student up at UEA as well. Um, this question sort of goes back to one of your original points, um, and it relates to uh, sort of where the intended benefits of this expansion in, in agricultural production go, um, because it seems like, particularly from Karen's uh, presentation, and I've heard this elsewhere, that a lot of this is driven towards uh, horticultural production and things like flowers and exports to Europe. Um, and I'd be curious to hear somebody else's thoughts on how that relates to food security, because um, it seems like, yeah, that that might result in a uh, economic production for those farmers. Um, but as far as uh, an increase in food security for smallholder farmers and even for those larger scale farmers, um, it seems like potentially that gets them more involved in a global food market, which has other potentially negative implications. <coughs> Yeah, so who's wealth, who's security? Yeah. On that side, anyone nodding their head vigorously? Yeah. I'm not sure if this microphone works over here. Does it? Oh. Hello, um, Laura Fox from Fauna and Flora International. I just had a question for Karen, a clarification about the um, figures that were presented on the potential for um, uh, hectares to come under irrigation. And if that was actually land that is currently already um, under agriculture, or if it, that includes also the sort of degraded lands that get talked about to bring that in under agriculture, and how that's actually linking up with land use policy and informing that debate. I think two very good questions for Karen. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Did you hear those two questions? Thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, the last question, I'm not sure I got that totally, but is it related to uh, whether the degraded land was taken into account in our potential uh, assessment? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, okay. No, it was not uh, explicitly taken into account. It was actually uh, a, a quite simple water balance type assessment where we looked at the available recharge. So we looked at renewable uh, groundwater and how that could be converted into irrigated land, basically. And then, of course, you can add on top of those maps, you can add other factors that then may restrict uh, your potential from degraded land, from poor soils, uh, from uh, like what Alan was talking about, uh, poor yields, uh, so that you maybe the water's there, but you can't get access to it quickly enough. Some of these aspects uh, have not been addressed in that assessment. And the earlier question relating to the benefits, I think relating to your typology somehow, uh, the se food security versus commercial usage. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it, there's a, a huge sort of need to look more into these aspects of when you increase the irrigation, not only from from groundwater in Africa, what happens to to food security for the for the poorer farmers, for the rural uh, residents, and um, what I think we see now is that there's a huge increase in in production of horticulture, and that's not only flowers, but very much uh, vegetables and so on. 
because of uh, growing cities and, and larger demand from the urban centers. And in a way, that's, that's good because it, su it supports uh, more nutritional uh, diet also for the, for the rural people. Um, so I think that's good. And actually what we also see is that many of the households and the families, they have uh, plots that are both irrigated and non-irrigated. And in many cases, the, the non-irrigated plots are set aside for, for stable crops. And that means they are also covered in a way, uh, at least <laughs> if you don't have very uh, drought years, then, then you will get uh, your food security also from, from other uh, sources. Likewise, we mentioned the livestock, and, and I think that's a general trend that we see that the farmers, they have a sort of a, a multitude of, of strategies or diversity in, in, in their uh, activities so that they ensure that they have covered themselves in terms of food security. So it's both from livestock, from stable crops, and from, uh, from vegetables or whatever. And, and they will probably strive to do that, whatever the economy tells them to do because it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental uh, uh, requirement for them. So, Karen, uh, and, it's... And it might, uh, it might compromise on their earnings, on their income, but, but, yeah, they will have to sustain themselves at the end of the day. So, in some ways, it's about dealing with uncertainty a little bit, at which point I can pass it over to, to Lila. Well, I'm not sure I'm talking about uncertainty, but I, I just wanted to... We need to really bring in land governance into the question, the question of land and water, and we're really talking just about water here and water development, because, I mean, who is ultimately going to access this potential of groundwater. And in India, it was largely big landowners who actually had formal rights to land. And we're talking, if we're talking in terms, we need to talk about the informal users mm -hmm. who don't actually have formal rights, bring together water and land rights, and also ask really big questions around, are we going to open up s a scope for land and water grabbing when you're talking about unlocking this potential? Because ultimately, the you'll have lots of land that suddenly becomes productive. What ultimately happens then to people's food security, water security, et cetera. So I think these are wider questions around control, power, and the, a huge gender dimension there too. Because if you're having a lot of land and groundwater developed in one place, you're gonna have implications for uh, women's uh, informal rights, domestic uses of water, et cetera. So maybe even opening up questions about the right to water, the right to food, trying to bring them together. Thank you, Lila. Question for Alan then. So when these maps were produced, the big blues, and they produced, you know, an enormous media interest, what was specific perhaps to, to the interest from Africa um, in relation to those those maps? Because they certainly got the caught the attention of the BBC. <coughs> but other media? And I, I still get a lot of <laughs> I still get a lot of questions about it, probably probably weekly from, from different from different people. It was really interesting the different uh, responses we, we got uh, and still get. Uh, there is a lot of interest in the commercial application. So uh, can, uh, you know, we're setting up this irrigation, this, this business, this agriculture business, where should we go, what should we do, wh what's, what's, what's involved? Uh, and generally I, I, I use it as a, a way of, of, of urging caution really and understanding what the, the groundwater, groundwater resources are like. There was also reactions from sci uh, other scientists, and some were slightly uh, slightly worried about putting out a, a, a signal that there was a lot of groundwater out there because we like to be quite quite quiet about it in case anybody uses it and exploits it, which might be might be a might be a disaster. Uh, but I think the overall d oh, the overriding uh, consensus is, is one of opportunity. How do we exploit this opportunity? And there, the trouble with groundwater is it costs money to exploit. There is a, a high cost of entry to developing groundwater. Unless you're, in a, you're fortunate enough to be in an area with, uh, that allows you to drill manually, which, uh, where that, it's only in very specific environments where you've got very shallow water tables and soft sediments, then you can e exploit it manually for just maybe a few hundred dollars or maybe parts of Ethiopia where you've got springs that you, ca that you can access. But for most other places, it involves drilling a borehole, uh, which costs something in the region of five, you know, $5,000 plus. And that is a very high cost of entry for, for Tony's farmers, for your 10 million farmers. 
Uh, and, and that 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 to me as a hydrogeologist is, you know, you know that's another message to to try and get out there. It's not that we can just very simply encourage people to use it. There's a huge cost, and who pays that cost? Because uh, most of the poor farmers that Tony's talking about will not be able to 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 gain access to to this resource because of that high cost of entry. Thank you, Alan. Um, Violet, just on that point, what do you think from Otuke, Northern Uganda? You know, can farmers afford the kind of technologies required to get 20, 30 meters down into the ground? And Richard, maybe you could add something on that. Uh, thank you so much, Alan. You know, reflecting at the Northern situation in Uganda and looking at the smallholder farmers, looking at the groundwater, uh, maybe the question you're asking is the appropriateness of the technologies because uh, I think uh, Karen was talking about the gender dimension. Uh, for example, in Uganda, you have the bulk of the smallholder farmers being women and in the older age category. The young ones prefer not to engage into a sector that is quite unreliable and predictable. That's one. But then maybe we could also be talking about the green water and looking at maybe issues to do with conservation agriculture, issues to do with uh, cover crops, where you're increasing the water within the root zone. And definitely for us as a program, we are out there to try and look at what are those appropriate, feasible, in terms of cost, in terms of uh, manipulation, kind of technologies that we can test and work with farmers to, to, to enhance the productivity of their farms. Because at the end of the day, just as uh, 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 Alan rightly puts it, it's quite, ex we ex would be expecting too much for the women in northern Uganda and the main to engage into this kind of investment. But then also again, looking at the sub-Saharan Africa, I think the level of use of water productively in the agriculture system is still very low. So the question would be, have we exhausted the other options for us to get into groundwater? Uh, even when we say that there is sufficient or adequate amounts of water, do we have sufficient data? For example, if you came to my country, would you be able to find and pinpoint and touch that data? to look at it, is it consistent? And if you started extracting it, over what period of time? And then if we have extracted this water, looking at the implications in terms of uh, the other environmental services this water plays, what does it mean at the end of it all? Thank you. Thank you, Violet. The gentleman sitting behind you would probably know something about the groundwater in that part of the world. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Richard Taylor. I'm from University College London, and um, I spent some time living in uh, in a patch and Lira in the uh, in, in the early 90s. Uh, but anyway, um, speci two specific points. One is uh, cost of entry that Alan uh, uh, mentioned. Um, there are uh, uh, there's been strong pushes to reduce that cost of drilling. It's a major, obviously, threshold for people to to get over. Um, uh, I'm told from some uh, reliable sources, colleagues of mine who are testing hand drilling, hand augering in, in northern Uganda as an example, where the cost of a well now are down to a thousand pounds or slightly less. One of the I was going to mention that a little bit later this, this afternoon. Still, that's extremely a large amount of money, but f uh, we're coming down from, uh, you asked the specific question, Alan, yeah, you can drill 20, 25 meters and it will cost you inwards of around a thousand pounds at the moment. Still a very high sum of money, but the, 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 the cost is coming down. Um, the second point, I think, which is being maybe overlooked here in, uh, um, and one kind of characteristic of groundwater um, is its distributed nature. And the fact that you can you can uh, you can scale up uh, use according to your demand, and it's also distributed, obviously not universally distributed, but it is distributed in such a way that those wishing to develop the resource, those that have access to it, can do so. If we were to talk about surface water resources in, in a moment here, it's extremely problematic to start talking about distribution networks for surface water resources. But I do take Violet's earlier point that you may want to start with some cheaper options first particularly things around uh, rainwater harvesting uh, itself. But 
Um, I just think that that point about the distributed nature of the resource is an important one to, uh, to keep in mind. If you were to start valuing that groundwater, imagine if you want to use a simple economic analysis of the replacement costs of getting that storage of water to that location uh, via some other means would be uh, c uh, quite substantial. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, the issue of replacement costs, tankering operations in those parts of the world, you know, in emergencies are, are the sort of the norm, but I wonder how often they get briefly. assessed for economic uh, rigor. Just, just I think the point about distributed nature of the resource is important, but it also the other side of the coin is the distributed nature of the regulatory problem, because then you've got, enorm you've got multiple abstraction points from a groundwater body, which you then have to think about in terms of how do you conserve that resource. And I think that's been part of the problem in Asia. Whereas if you have a single point abstraction point on, a say, a river, then your regulatory point of negotiation is one intake. So there is this other side, the risk of a distributed nature. Thank you, Richard. This side of the room is very silent. I don't know whether it's anything to do with a smaller community of people feeling intimidated by a larger community, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to bring some of you in, so I'm just going to pass the mic over. Just, just introduce yourself and uh, say a little bit about what you've heard so far. Um, uh, hello, Aitor Naranjo uh, from Plan UK. Um, um, Actually, I, I, I would have um, a, a question uh, concerning other, other technologies. In this case, maybe, maybe, maybe really expensive for small uh, farmers, but maybe useful for other, <laughs> for other actors, uh, such as outdoor uh, has harvester uh, systems to withdraw water from um, uh, condensation. So I don't know if there's uh, anything regarding to this. So some of the alternative we saw, I think, in Karen's uh, presentation, something about that. Um, shall we ask her if she has a comment, feedback, or is there another question? Um, I'll come to Karen in a moment because we have an, uh, an, uh, one of our listeners is, has got a, ca uh, um, a, a question. I know, Charles, um, it would be quite useful just to bring you in on uh, sort of India um, you know, some of the insights from India, this, you know, the, the sort of regulate, what, what, what Imi would call the numbers problem, mm. you know. Mm. Um, it's a very different, the, 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 the management challenge is a very different, um, it's a very different thing for distributed, opportunistic, farmer-led groundwater withdrawals. Um, so perhaps we should just, just hear from Charles. Um, okay, that wasn't actually what I was going to say, okay. but, <laughs> but yeah, of course, I mean, that's, uh, you know, regulation of, uh, as Tushar Shah says, you know, the, the groundwater anarchy, millions of small-scale users is not something that um, uh, can be done, actually, it's, uh, that's, let's be fair. And it, so that, yeah, the regulation that does take place uh, is related more to the, the unreliable electricity supplies, and I know that's an attempt to use electricity regulation or regulating access to irrigation as a, a, as a controlled measure in Gujarat, but that's not proving to be that successful. Um, can I go back to my other point? Just of course. To, yeah, I mean, I, what just strikes me, um, uh, or I mean, concerns me is the, um, the, the, the need to, to actually look at both surface water and groundwater together. Uh, and I thought that, you know, the study that BGS did was excellent. But what, what would be interesting to, alongside that, is to do a similar analysis on, you know, basically on the uh, you know, river flow records from, from different areas and actually relate those in some way to, to, to recharge. I think that's in many ways is, is, is more interesting, or at least as interesting as looking at rainfall intensity, uh, relating rainfall intensity to groundwater recharge. I mean, you know, rainfall tends to be surface water before it becomes, before it becomes groundwater. But I, I'd also just like to make the point that the, you know, quite a few times people are talking about uh, recharge as though this, this is a, you know, this is a, uh, the, the, the route to sustainable, sustainable use of, of, of groundwater. But of course, 
yeah, recharge, uh, water that's recharged is water that would have gone somewhere else. And as we see, you know, the watershed development programs in South Asia have been very successful in improving recharge. But all that's done is increase the groundwater extraction. And the, the, at, a, at a major redistribution of access to water, in many, in many, many of the large basins, there's less water flowing down to the, uh, to the delta areas because it's being captured, it's recharging, it's then being pumped, and it's increasing the evaporation rates, the consumptive use in the headwater area. So, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a many would argue that's very good because that's gone to, to poorer, po the traditionally farmers who've been much poorer in the past at the expense of fairly wealthy farmers in the, in the Delta areas. But, it, mm. but it, there is this need to, to recognize the, you know, the conservation of, law of conservation of mass, that if water is, is captured, used uh, in one area, then it's not available for, for, for somewhere else. So, so definitely monitoring, you, Alan was mentioning monitoring systems and the needs for, for these. But I think it, what's needed in the future in areas is to, is to look at groundwater and surface water together in any, any study uh, and, and any kind of planning process along the lines that um, Bruce was talking about. Alan, uh, before we've got um, um, about five minutes, um, Karen, before you, um, before you leave us, um, I'm not sure if, you're, uh, if you can hang around for the afternoon session, but that would be a big ask. But before you leave us, any reflections on the point um, Charles Batchelor was, was bringing <laughs> up there, this sort of link between you know, you know, the need for research, you know, that kind of gets rid of the silos, I suppose, a little bit, the sort of um, surface water, groundwater um, taken together. Firstly, secondly, quick point here from a uh, different point from Kimi Sishink, um, who wanted you to talk a little bit about why you think groundwater has been neglected in what you called the food value chain. Um, now you may have to remind us uh, a little bit what that is, but, but, but Karen, if you could um, mm. keep it short, a couple of minutes. Um. Okay, let, let me take the first, uh, or the last one first, uh, regarding the value chain. Well, I think uh, there's been a, quite a bit of focus on, on addressing the value chain, and I fully agree that we have to make all or the, the, the parts of the chain work in terms of getting food production and get that uh, efficient. Uh, but what I see that th is that uh, when people are talking about the, the food chain, they often neglect uh, the basic resource, which is the, the water. And uh, so I, I just wanted to point to that fact that we need to look at the water resource as kind of an input to the, to the value chain, because it is a, a, a limited resource. It's not, uh, you know, it's not unrestricted, and it has a lot of implications how it's being managed, and uh, it's uh, it's coming across more and more. But I think many of the companies that are uh, focusing specifically on the value chain, they have missed out totally on the issue of the water resource. So basically, that was it. And then, of course, when we're talking groundwater, we have to look at the groundwater resource. So that was my point that I wanted to bring out. The other point, I'm not sure exactly what was meant uh, related to groundwater and surface water. Um, well, the whole issue about sustainability is, is, is something that we will not easily solve uh, to, to ensure that groundwater development is, is sustainable. And what we have discussed now is that the inbuilt uh, sort of uh, property of groundwater being distributed is, is a good, is, is, it's a virtue that, that we use and we, we can develop uh, further in terms of you know drilling holes uh, in many places and, and benefiting a lot of farmers but on the other hand it becomes very difficult to control and that is that is the total uh, sort of dilemma that we're facing here when we're talking about groundwater uh, and it has not been solved in any place of, of the world we have uh, over development of groundwater and those in the developed and developing countries and it might also occur in africa there are some incipient uh, examples around in sub-Saharan Africa, and certainly in South Africa, where this has occurred. And I think what we see in many places is that if it's not controlled by the government, if it's not controlled by the farmers, if it's not indirectly controlled by energy prices or in energy uh, rationing or so on, then nature will take its course and it will sort of be uh, sort of self-controlled in a way. As, uh, Alan was saying if we have small aquifers, well, we can only draft uh, the amount of water that's available and hopefully and luckily in many of these places it's replenishable and hopefully then the socioeconomic and environmental consequences 
will not be overwhelming. But that's maybe the question then, how, how can we um, sort of alleviate some of those uh, environmental and socioeconomic problems so it doesn't become overwhelming? But other than that, it will take its course, and, and, and then we'll have to live with it. So I think we, one thing we have to, I think, be very careful about and, and, and uh, sort of conscious about is whether we have systems that are replenishable in the long term or not, because it's totally two different situations. If it's not being replenished in current times, then we know it's a mining situation, and we have to think of other ways of developing the groundwater or, or getting water in the long term or changing. We, we, we wouldn't have uh, irrigation, for instance, uh, into the future. So that's something that we have to uh, account on uh, going forward. Uh, and another thing I think is we have to understand where the re where's the recharge going on. Any of the deeper aquifers that we may have to use in the longer term when shallow or groundwater becomes extended or it becomes uh, polluted, then we'll have to go for deeper groundwater. Then we'll have to understand where is it recharged. Is it being recharged where we dig it up or is it being recharged uh, further away, because that's uh, in many cases uh, what happens uh, in, in confined aquifers. So we have to protect those areas as much as possible. So understanding some of these things is, is critical. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Roger, do we have a couple of minutes? Um, one minute. One minute. If you'd like to, if, if if you'd like to round up from your side, then yeah. I'll okay. round up from ours. I just want to pick up on two things. One, the gentleman. Is it Plan? You're with Plan, yeah. And you mentioned sort of alternatives, alternative pumping technologies. Uh, Karen mentioned the, the sunflower, was it, pump? The sunflower pump. Yeah. And if you go around northern Uganda or Tanzania, I mean, I'm sure many of you know, solar power, solar panels are, are almost ubiquitous at a household level in many parts of, of, of East Africa now. The cost has plummeted. And I understand that Agwa and others are now looking at ways of supporting small farmers to start developing or looking into technologies that can use solar energy to pump. So, you know, the question being, do we end up with Charles's anarchy? And um, what, what, what are those kind of, what are those regulatory mechanisms that you can put in place that help prevent solar power generating a, a rush to the bottom of the aquifer? Um, in India, in Andhra Pradesh, I think it was largely free electricity that was uh, uh, extended to, to rural communities. So, you know, is there... Is there a challenge here, or is it just uh, a, a flash in the pan? Yes? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, I think it is a big problem how you regulate uh, groundwater abstraction. Uh, my concern would be as much about large commercial abstraction as small scale abstraction. And uh, picking up on Elisha's point about uh, the power dynamics on that, with uh, lots of foreign direct investment and large donor support behind creating an enabling environment for that investment. What does that enabling environment actually look like and whose interest is it for? Thank you, very valid point. Um, Don, Roger, can I continue this way? Last one. Um, the repeat of, uh, the, the risk of repeating myself, integrated water resources management, doesn't, doesn't that do exactly what you require here with uh, stakeholders at the basin level and within integrated water resources management one of the key things is regulation uh, legal authorities and then the knowledge and information on the resource use and then putting that through to people to use it in an equitable way very well said more comments feedback on this side or i have to i ha i get dragged gravitationally back to to roger you do um, thanks. Okay, thanks, Alan. Thanks, everyone, for a, for a healthy discussion. I mean, we had, you know, we covered a lot this morning, um, I think. Um, I mean, you know, if I could chip in my own view, I don't want to get too kind of hung up on the, on the management and regulatory side. I mean, we've heard the whole point about opportunistic, farmer-led, um, you know, scattered, dispersed groundwater management is it doesn't fit into conventional IWRM models. I mean, the kind of, you know, the, the instruments we use to regulate that kind of thing in, in Australia and, uh, uh, and Europe just simply are a non-starter um, when you're dealing with this, kind of, uh, with this kind of stuff. So you look for indirect instruments. But actually, I think more the, the, the of more interest is, is it takes us back really to the issue of rights and uh, capture and control and who's going to benefit. 
um, because uh, which will, as Lila was pointing out earlier, which which will depend in large part on the distribution, the security, the defensibility of land rights, um, and where there is ambiguity, and in the absence of regulation or very thin regulation, and with powerful interest groups, uh, water is captured. I mean, historically, it's captured by fair means or foul by by cities. You know, we come to the the towns and the cities <coughs> argument often by by foul. Um, but the issue, I think, for groundwater smallholder irrigation, which to some extent offers the hope and the opportunity of being reasonably equitable, equitable in terms of the distribution of benefits, if the land rights are not skewed disproportionately mm. to the better off. Although even then, you know, vibrant markets can help spread those benefits uh, between those with land and those without. But um, you know, it's this. Who benefits and is will 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 water to coin a, a, a phrase you know sort of run uphill to power and money, uh, which is one I got off you Tony, but I think you got off someone I, I forget where it comes from. Um, so that would be my that would be my 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 the, my nagging question. But anyway, um, I am now going to hand over to Bruce. I think we'll have the, the what we call the elevator. I can't believe I let the word elevator into my program. Um, 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 goodness, I'll be starting, starting to talk about going forwards next. Um, <laughs> Bruce, okay, introduce us to this. Point. Very briefly. Um, there's no, we agreed that this session, which is on your program, would probably be better held over to the wine reception itself. And because we don't have a lot of authors uh, with us. So what we're, what we're going to do is um, introduce the book. There's a book launch happening today. Um, we have three of the editors here, myself, Declan, and Mark at the back there. Karen Backer <coughs> cannot join us. Uh, she's still in Canada. Um, Tim Hardwick from Earthscan has turned up. And you'll be here to the wine reception? Certainly. Great. And <laughs> so he'll be managing to sell you um, copies of the book, should you so wish, um, I believe. You've bought there's some yeah. books here. I've noticed a competitor book. Uh, oh, you've bought one. That's good. Somebody else. There's another book on water security. I've noticed. So that, that's ours. That's yours. That, yes. That will get the prominent. Yes, I'm <laughs> get up surface. <laughs> very good. Um, so very briefly, not holding you from your lunch. Um, please do hang around till this afternoon for two reasons. A, you'll hear a bit more about the book. Um, we're co-chairing this as a book launch stroke, uh, this in, in examination of groundwater, um, which Roger was keen to, to do. So we're very grateful for that um, co-platform, if I can coin another awful word. Um, and also, more than that, a wine reception. And we've, as Roger said, we, I think we've over-purchased on the wine department. So plen plenty of reasons to stay around. Very briefly, um, we're very pleased that this book has come out. As you may gather, water security almost from nowhere became the sort of the term of interest. Um, so there's two books that I've noticed here. That I know there's another one in the pipeline with Claudia Paul was She's, I think, writing a book. Some of you may be part of that, sitting here. Um, so, you know, questions of what is water security? Uh, what extra meaning has it brought to the, you know, thorny questions around water management, many of which have cropped up today. Um, so please stick around and you'll hear some of the very brief introductions to the book at about quarter to four, I think it that says, yeah. Then that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and uh, thank you, Karen, uh, for joining us um, this morning and, and to the other uh, keynote speakers. Let's give them a round of applause.